This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hi, welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I'm Lisa Kimura. I'm the host of Family Affairs, a show for exploring issues related to how healthy public policies and efforts to increase gender equality help improve our overall quality of life for families in Hawaii. With me today is my first guest, Deborah Zeisman, the Executive Director of Hawaii Children's Action Network. Hello. Welcome. <clears throat> Before we get started, I just want to note that the views and opinions expressed on this program are entirely my own and those of my guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of any other organization, employer, or company. Welcome, Deborah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So tell me about what Hawaii Children's Action Network is doing this year in regards to bills and public policy work. So Hawaii Children's Action Network, we are a local nonprofit and we are building a movement on behalf of our children and families. So we bring together lots of nonprofits and also families, parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles who really want to make our community better. They, we want to make it the best place for kids and the best place really for families to raise their children. And we know we have a lot of um, room to grow in those areas. It's actually gotten harder and harder for families here to kind of be able to make it and thrive. Um, and so we have a number of policy priorities that we're coming together and, and really rallying behind um, to our state lawmakers. So how are you measuring exactly that things are getting harder for families? Well, we know we've had cost of living is rising and we've, we've seen through a number of things in the last few years that, um, like the United Way study that came out that showed that actually families up to close to $100,000 a year of, of income are really just getting by paycheck to paycheck and really in danger of um, dipping into poverty, potentially becoming homeless, those sorts of things. And a lot of our um, programs and supports for families and children have either been really flat, we haven't been growing them as much as they need to be, or they've been cut. I think that's some of it. So I think we look at um, all those supportive things around it. How do we make sure there's really good public education? How do we make sure there's good um, early childhood? Things like um, paid family leave for families so they can do the child caring that they need to when a new baby is born and affordable child care and affordable housing. So like all those things kind of together mm -hmm. is what we know makes a really rich, good, supportive. I mean, our work is how do we do a better job in our community supporting parents, supporting families in raising their kids. We don't want to replace them, right? right? We want to support them, enrich them, enrich them um, make it where they're less stressed. Um, able to play with their kids and um, lead just great, happy lives. Yeah. What kind of challenges are you seeing with affordability in regards to childcare? So it's been really getting worse, I mean, I think is the issue. So we, we did a whole study last year with University of Hawaii Center on the Family, taking a look at just um, where we have even childcare. So I think right now the average cost of childcare is about $10,000 a year. And for um, babies up to toddlers, it's actually more like $13,000 a year. So that is a lot of money. A lot of money, right? I mean, I, I'm a mom of two kids. They're both now in elementary school, but for a while I had two kids in childcare and preschool. Um, and at that time, my childcare and preschool bill was substantially more than my rent every month. And that was just astounding. I actually, I had to ask family to, to help out. Um, and both my husband and I work, um, we're kind of, you know, normal folks, normal salaries. I think that's the issue. Is a, a lot of families, thirteen thousand dollars a year for one child, is is really tough. I, I think is the issue. And we know families also can't really make the choice to stay home because our housing costs, for example, are so high. Um, we see families in Hawaii. Most people in the family are at work. Right. Um, they don't necessarily even have grandma or auntie necessarily who's able to do full-time childcare because often grandma and auntie are still working one, two, multiple jobs yeah. to kind of make things work. So um, what we know about childcare is we don't have enough of it. Um, it's tough here in Honolulu, but it's even worse out on the neighbor islands. Um, so across the state, we have about one childcare spot for every um, four kids. So that's Not nearly tough. Enough. Not yeah. nearly enough. But then when you get out to um, the babies, it's even worse. We have fewer and fewer, so at any price point. So even if you can afford to pay a huge amount of money, there's not child care providers. Um, and our child care subsidies and our public preschool program have been growing, but slowly. They've not been keeping up with the pace of, um, we've had more kids being born in mm -hmm. the state, so they're mm -hmm. not really keeping up. So they're growing, but they're growing slowly, I would say. Um, as, as we were discussing before the show, um, our child care help and our preschool help 
aren't necessarily helping those families except maybe the ones who are the poorest of our families, mm -hmm. like really, really low income or per perhaps homeless families. And what do they define as the lowest income? What would be the threshold? Well, it kind of depends on the program, I would say, but um, a lot of those programs are really only helping families up to like a family income in like the, say, the $40,000 a year, which um, it's tough to really make it. If you have one or two families may, and you're still making only like $40,000 a year, yeah. um, you're, you're really struggling. So, But we, we know, for example, from that United Way report that really families even closer to like $100,000 a year are struggling to make it yeah. if they have two or three incomes in their, in their household. So um, we're trying to take a look at that, the whole range, right? Our lowest income kids, but also really most of us in yeah. that kind of more like working family um, place. Absolutely. And it's tough. Our minimum wage is still pretty low, mm -hmm. right? So um, we, we know salaries are not necessarily at the same rate if you were like in San Francisco where you have a lot of people making a much higher higher um, income level. So what kind of bills and policies is HCAN focused on this year to try to address that? Yeah, we have a few different things. So um, child care and preschool are big focus for us. That's been a, a huge amount of work. We just know it's been a, a struggle for a long time. So we have a, a new coalition of families and organizations that are coming together and they're really working on a couple of things. So one, we are advocating for more money to keep growing our, our quality public preschool program. So that's been growing in the last um, three, four years. So we've seen, um, we have 22 of our uh, public elementary schools now have a preschool classroom and 18 of our charter schools have that. So we are actually asking collectively for probably about $40 million of new money to keep growing that, that program, to keep expanding it. Um, are so, there any other issues going on with it right now that's preventing people from enrolling or anything that's uh, hindering the growth of the program? Well, I think it's still a pretty uh, a hidden program. A lot of families don't know that it's even an option, that they may have a charter school or an elementary school in their community that has a free preschool program for four-year-olds. And they're, they're all great. They're running really fabulous, high-quality programs. So I, I encourage you, if you're interested, take a look and see if the elementary school in your community has it. I think the other piece is we are trying to make sure that those programs are not just serving the lowest income families, but as we can get more money, more resources, that they're, again, growth, right? Sure. I think the way we looked at it was let's start with our low income families, but we want, um, we really want to be serving eventually all families. Sure. So th that's a piece of it. Um, and then childcare, I think that, that's a really four year olds. We're seeing four, more four year olds in like more of a school setting. Mm -hmm. But we know people have babies. Those children need, um, we want a, a safe environment for them, um, an accessible, available, you know, kind of in the location that they want, affordable, and then if possible, a high quality environment for those kids. And we've got to look from, really from birth, because we know moms and dads are going back to work really within a couple of weeks after the baby is born right now. Hawaii doesn't have a paid leave policy, which many states do have now, so they're going back to work. And the really entire rest rapidly. of the world, has. and the rest of the world, <laughs> right? But a lot of moms, including me, are you know, I went back with both my kids when they were like five or six weeks weeks old. That's the reality. So we need childcare then, good, affordable childcare from the time they're like five or six weeks old mm -hmm. until they're at least four or five years old. I mean, that's what we have to think about. So it's not just about preschool. I think so. We are looking at how do we um, get more of that childcare subsidy money out to families. So that's um, there's two programs. One is called Preschool Open Doors, and one is called Child Care Connections. And they're both part of Department of Human Services. But how do we make sure that those monies get out to families again at a higher income level? So it's not just the poorest of poor families, but that it hits more of our just all of our working families like um, that are making a more middle, kind of middle class sure. income. Um, and then it's enough money. So we hear right now, the, there's a sliding scale right now in Hawaii. And for some families, they're getting only a really small amount. They're being offered like, here's $50 off your child care bill, which is just not enough. So no. how do we make sure that it's enough money that folks can actually get out there and find, you know, how, how do we make it where it's $800 a month, not $50 a month, so that you can really Take, take kind of that, that subsidy money and, and buy childcare. But I think we're also looking at how do we, how do we get more people working in the field? That's, that's an issue. Like even if you have some money, depending on the community you're living in, there might be no place to take your child, mm. right? So what are we gonna 
we're kind of grappling. Honestly, that's a tough question, and that's a nationally. It's like how do we? Um, frankly, some of it's pay providers more, mm -hmm. right? Um, other countries do mm -hmm. much more than how do we value that kind of work? Right. It's often provided by women. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that they are being paid good wages? That um, a job that are livable for them. That are livable for them. That a job providing childcare, doing that important, important work of early education, is compensated appropriately. Um, so that it's a desirable job to go into and stay in and that it's important. Yeah. Um, so we need to be paying those providers more, but we, we have to figure out a way to do it where we're not charging the parents more because parents are already like outpriced. Right? Sure. They can't afford it as it is. So how do we, you know, we're looking frequently at, at government money. So instead of making parents pay and providers working like slave wages, how do we get government to pay for good quality child care? Um, well, and what do they say? The investment in early childhood is like a 17 to 1 return? Yeah, depending on which study you look at, it's a huge, we, we know that those early years are the period of the most brain development and rapid development. And anyone who's had children knows that your kids are like crazy sponges at that age. So it's critical. That's, that's the quality piece. We want to make sure kids are not getting plunked in front of a TV all day, that they're getting like rich, you know, they're being read to and sung to and played games with and all that kind of rich early childhood um, learning that we want them to have. Um, and it's also an economic driver. There's been tons of research done that if you have good child care, that enables people to get to work. Mm -hmm. um, and reliably, right? It means you're not missing days of work because, oh my gosh, I have 12 sitters that I piecemeal together and this one called in sick, that you can get to work reliably, that workers are less stressed out. They, mm -hmm. they can focus on work because they know that their child or children are in a, a good, Being safe, well cared quality for. Right, environment, right? So that, and especially for women, we know that's a huge thing that help, that um, this sort of perpetuates the inequities that we see is that frequently it's women who feel that they have, at the end of the day, the responsibility for, for the children and the child care. And if there is not good quality, affordable child care in their community, they might feel that they need to drop out of the workforce. Um, even if that poses an extra economic hardship on their, their own family too. So it's like if we want women to be sort of rising up the, the career ladders as well and in the workforce in meaningful ways, you've got to have child care. Right. Right, and to be able to stay in the workforce and be able to advance your own career without sacrificing exactly. your opportunities. So we need it. I think more and more countries, and frankly, more states across the nation, are looking at childcare more as infrastructure. I don't know that sounds a little bit crass, right? Because it is about kids, and we want our we want our kids to have the best, and we should be doing a heck of a lot more to demand that. But it's also part of this infrastructure. Just like just like you need good transportation and roads for people to get to work, we need childcare for people to get to work. Um, and frankly, that's. Schools do that, right? From K-12, you have a system where families can be at work because they know their kid is in a pretty, hopefully a good quality environment during the day. We've not done that for the birth to age you know, five kindergarten space. Um, and it's pricey. I think here and across the nation, a year of childcare is about the same as a year of college, but we focus a lot more on how do we make college affordable, not how do we make childcare and preschool affordable. So. Um, even when the science shows that those years are probably the more critical ones in a, in a person's development. Yes. That those, those first four or five years are probably more important than those college years, frankly. Very right? much so, yeah. Um, but, look, but you look at where we put money. We, we're putting a lot of money in making sure you know, young people get to college, make, it, make sure it's affordable, but all those they, things. We haven't thought about and the path to start there in the beginning. we're not thinking about that foundation. And everything we know um, shows that if you set a child up with that, that foundation, that's how they thrive. Then you have a solid foundation to build upon for the rest of their life. And if we miss that, if we have kids in a bad environment, it's actually really detrimental. And so hold that thought. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna talk to mm -hmm. a mom, Julia, right after this break, yes. and talk to her about exactly that circumstance where being able to be forced into a situation where you have to make sacrifices mm -hmm. that may not be what you necessarily want to do, but just to be able to get by. Yep. We'll also talk a little bit about paid family leave and the impact that has on families um, and how. With policies in place, we also have workers that are returning to the workforce, are invested in their employer, and are yeah. more likely to be productive while they're on the job. Great. <laughs> um, so, we'll 
When we get back from this quick break, we'll be talking to Julia Joseph. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Welcome back to Family Affairs at the Think Tech Hawaii Studios. With us on the phone, we have Julia Joseph, who is a new mom taking part in a program called Pico Pals, and here to talk about her experience giving birth to her most recent baby and the challenges of going back to work, affording child, affording child care, and just being able to make ends meet. Hi, Julia. Welcome. Hi, ladies. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So tell us a little bit about what your experience has been with going back to work and what that challenge really feels like. Um, it's not easy. I gave birth about four months ago um, and had to return to work after giving birth three months. So mm -hmm. it's the constant battle of, do I go back to work and leave my, my newborn with someone um, just so that I can be in the workforce or do I take a step back and say, okay, I'll stay home and just, you know, raise my baby. It was really hard to look at a baby's face, you know, and say, man, I, I have to leave you. A baby that is still nursing, a baby that is still trying to, you know, get used to the world. So that transition was actually really, really hard, very emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What kinds of struggles are you finding yourself faced with as far as childcare? Childcare is extremely hard um, because what happens is it's the cost that really gets you at first mm -hmm. um, of how much it is, especially for an infant. I also have a three-year-old. Three-year-old who is potty trained, it's not that expensive, um, maybe doable, but an infant, of course, requires a lot more attention, um, and there's a lot more work. So that cost has been really expensive and also uh, makes you step back and kind of look at your budget and say, okay, well, am I going to save for my baby's future um, or am I going to spend it all on daycare right now or preschool and, you know, basically working to pay that preschool or daycare bill? Right, that's an incredibly tough choice to have mm -hmm. to make, and knowing right. that the budget is yeah. being sacrificed, the income that you're making has to be sacrificed just to go to work is really tough. Yep. Right, and then you have to also calculate in, you know, you're paying a mortgage. You, you, you've got a car now to fit the two babies in, right? Right. So right. now you got a new car payment, and you have electricity, and they, everyone needs to eat, apparently. So <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's a lot of factors that has to be included in when, when, when considering childcare. Right. What do you think your feelings have changed as far as balancing work, childcare, life? How have your feelings changed since needing to go back to work the second time? It, oh man, I am bouncing around because as a woman, I want to work. I want to contribute to my household too. Um, as a mother, I want to stay home mm -hmm. <laughs> and take care of my babies, right? But I, I feel like if I, if I could find someone that I trust or a, mm -hmm. a, an academy or preschool or that is trustworthy and affordable, that battle is not that hard. Mm -hmm. I can say, I can go to work and know that my, my babies are being well taken care of, everything is okay. You know, I'm not staring at my phone waiting for that phone call to come of, oh, come get your kid because you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a, I'm bouncing around because the transition isn't easy coming back to work. And then at the end of the day, 
I have to leave work because I, I just can't afford childcare. I, I can't. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to to not save for the future and just put all of the uh, all of the ends to something you know that's temporary. When I know kindergarten is around the corner and, and it could be free, right? Right. If you had the option to have, for example, some paid family leave during the time of your maternity leave and return to work, do you feel like that would change your feelings about going back to work or would it change your circumstances in some way? I, I definitely think it would. I think if it's, not only if it's paid, but if it's longer too. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, six weeks is, is not enough time. Mom is still battling her hormones and emotions and, you know, still connecting with baby. Um, and the most that I've had with um, family time leave is unpaid, by the way, mm -hmm. is three months. And so for three months, you're enjoying home with baby, but also the bills are piling right, up because right. they're not working and you're not getting paid. Right. Um, so... Right. Very hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going through this experience yourself, do you feel like there is advice that you would give to other parents in the same situation? I think the advice I would give is to is to really is to really sit down and kind of focus on the priorities and and really determine if it is worth it to go back to work. Right? Or is it even a better plan just to stay home? Mm -hmm. and take care of the baby. And I know sometimes that's not a choice. It's not an option for a lot of moms. It's not an option. You have to go back, and sometimes even sooner. Right. So I, I think it is a matter of just sitting down and seeing what best fits the family. Um, like Deborah said, you know, sometimes auntie and grandma can't, can't watch them. And then now you're in the process of interviewing, which I've been, mm -hmm. um, interviewing other people outside of the family and, and seeing if, they can be trusted, right? And then there's also availability. You may be ready to go back to work, but the preschool or daycare may not have that time, you know, for enrollment. That's so right. it's a lot of sitting down, planning, kind of getting ahead of yourself. As soon as you know you're expecting, I would suggest putting your name on all the lists mm. for daycare because mm -hmm. the wait list is also a factor. That's a really good point. Deb, what kind of challenges are we seeing as far as provider availability? Do you have specifics on that? Well, I think nationally and in Hawaii, we are actually seeing fewer and fewer child care providers, especially for the babies and the toddlers. And mm -hmm. no one's quite sure why that is. I personally think a lot of it has to do around the horrible pay. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's taking care of kids it's knows it is exhausting at all. <laughs> work. People work long hours. Um, they often do it because they love children, mm -hmm. um, but it is it is not a lucrative career. And I think right now, especially in communities like Hawaii with low unemployment, there's there's maybe other other choices, other things that those folks can can do. But I think, like we heard from Julia, I think our our community is putting families in a really impossible situation. Um, we're not supporting family choice. Mm -hmm. We're not supporting families who want to stay home and do caregiving. And we're also not helping them get back to work by providing them good, good child care options. So, you know, it's, it's this sort of horrible, um, horrible choices mm -hmm. that we have. Like Rocking none of them are good. All the time. Yeah. None of them are good choices. Um, and I think it, you know, it used to be that you could have a family getting by with one income. Even in our community, that used to be the case. You could have one person out uh, earning money and the other parent perhaps being able to stay home. That is generally not the case anymore. Um, and so what are folks supposed to do? I, I mean, I do think it's also here and nationally we're seeing people delay having kids mm -hmm. or choosing not to have kids at all. And lots of times they will say it's because of the economics. They, um, housing costs are high. People have crushing student debt. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't think they can afford to have kids, which is not just sad, but I think also a kind of a dangerous place to be going as a as a society. Well, and we see what's happening in Italy and other places where the birth yeah. rate's falling, and there's it's, major it's, economic There's major economic implications if, if, as a community, we are making it impossible for people to have children, right. which is kind of what we're doing. We're not letting them stay home because we're not providing paid leave. Um, we're not letting them go back to work because we're not providing affordable child care. So what are people supposed to do? Right. 
Right. We've got a couple, couple minutes left in the show. <laughs> what would you say would be big wins for HCAN and for the state of Hawaii, really, this session? Yeah, well, we, we are continuing to work on paid family leave as well. I think we would like eventually to see um, at least 16 weeks of partial pay. So maybe not your full paycheck, but enough of your pay that you can stay home and keep paying the bills, right? As Julia said, the bills start piling up. Right. Um, and you know what? Some people argue 16 weeks is not enough, but right, I would say it's it's better than nothing. It would be a good start. California just started talking about six months. Fantastic. Other countries have a year or 18 months. And parents can serve mm. those consecutively, so you can right. have two or more years right. home with your child. And not just moms, but dads too. <laughs> exactly. Right? So we, we want to encourage that. We want to encourage families to stay home in those formative years, but not um, yeah. drop into poverty because of it, not have to max out their credit cards or drain their retirement funds, uh, be able to keep paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And I think we need yep. to really fight hard to make sure that we have more affordable child care that we're putting out. We're, we're helping to pay for more child care for more families. Mm -hmm. And real quickly, as we're wrapping up, any kinds of cultural shifts that you think that we need to undergo in order to be more supportive of families? I mean, I think that's, a big, that's the big one. A, it's about moms and dads, right? I think we want more dads doing caregiving, right. more dads doing child care. So it's for us the maternity and paternity leave. Um, and I think acknowledging that women are in the workforce um, and, and they want to stay in the workforce. And they want to stay in the workforce and we all want that as a community. But to do that, we need to be supporting good, affordable child care um, across our state. That's Wonderful. what it takes. Wonderful. Well, real quick too, how can someone get involved in those efforts? So if they want to check out our website, um, it's hawaii-can.org and you can sign up. We have a whole growing parent advocate group. Um, that comes out and helps you know send messages to your lawmakers to say we, we need child care, we need paid leave, we need these things. So that's the best way. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining me, Deb. Julia, thanks for joining us via the phone. Thank and you for having me. Thank you so Wonderful much. conversation today. Lots more to work on. And please yeah. uh, come back again and we can talk some more about what's going right. on this session. Um, Again, thanks for being here. I'm Lisa Kimura. I'm the host of Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you next time.